Gurdjieff. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the September 2021 20, version of Practico's Costs Chat Between Friends. The friends on this occasion are the usual suspects of Andy Ellis, Managing Director of Practico, me, Jeremy Morgan, retired cost silk and continuing consultant to Practico. And we're very pleased to welcome Professor Dominic Regan, who is well known to most of you, I'm sure. Um, he's Professor of Law, a, a legal trainer par excellence. He is a practicing, a, a non practicing solicitor, but qualified as a solicitor, head of Now How at Frankel Topping and a special advisor to the ACL. And the only thing which he didn't put on his little CV um, that I would like to share with you, that he's an active tweeter, um, but he has a very dodgy Twitter handle of Krug79. So I leave him to, to explain that to you all. Um, we're gonna to touch on a variety of topics um, today, uh, of hopefully of, of current interest. Um, first of all, a, a discussion of the mandatory ADR proposals. Secondly, uh, budgeting. How is um, current practice relating to how it appeared when the pilot scheme was in force? Then we've got uh, Dominic's favorite case on post-trial costs and other orders, related orders. Um, we'll have a quick look at how the new witness statement regime is working out and a very, very brief look at uh, the guideline hourly rates which have just been uh, published. And given that it's Dominic, I expect there'll be much, much more. So over to you, Dominic, on mandatory ADR. Oh, thank you. Oh, so just on the handle, um, Krug79 was an astonishing vintage of said champagne. And I bought it, uh, I bought six bottles at 60 quid each. Um, they've all been long, long consumed. And it now makes about 1,200 a bottle, but it was, so that's where it came from. And because, and sorry, I do write the, um, with Sean Jones QC, um, Council Magazine wine column, which I think probably gets more attention than anything I've ever written or said in earth, on earth, in law. But uh, anyway, um, off we go. Yeah, um, ADR, and it is something that um, the, the senior judiciary are mad keen on. Um, uh, Sir Geoffrey Voss, of course, now um, the top banana in civil litigation, the, the master of the role since January this year. Um, he thought, and, and has long thought, uh, I understand, that the, um, the, the decision in Halsey and Milton Keynes NH Trust back in, what, 2004, he thought that was, a, the, the court could just frankly um, got it wrong. That was the case um, where the court said, uh, Lord Justice Ward, and we'll come back to him, said, you can't order people uh, to engage in ADR um, because to do so would breach um, Article 6. And, and afterwards, he was heard to say, that he was swayed by Lord Lester of Hearn Hill and all these human rights bods who intervened. And in, 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 uh, nine years later, he, he said um, in, in a, a judgment, which I thought was rather um, incredibly memorable, um, in a case called Right and Right, he said, uh, we were wrong. Um, and he said that they, they, they'd been confused and misled and, and he, a total um, uh, turncoat. Uh, and later in his Who's Who entry, I think he described himself as sort of a gamekeeper uh, turned poacher and he put whatever, right, whatever the way, right way around is and said, you know what, I am now a fervent believer in mediation. So we, we've moved a long way. And uh, I mean, the idea of saying to people that um, you should try and sort this out between you, um, it seems eminently sensible because you know, going to trial is always, I mean, you might, I'm talking to the expert here, um, it's always a lottery. And the sense, you know, if, if one could do um, a deal, well, so much, so much the better. So there's a real sense of um, that it, it's the right thing to do. And then in um, summer of 2019, the um, uh, Court of Appeal um, in a case called Lomax and Lomax um, held, which obviously correctly, that um, the court could order parties to do something else sensible, um, which is to participate in early neutral evaluation. And because that got the rules committee going, because next time they met, they said, well, hold on a bit. We now know um, that we've got the power, the court will have said so, um, to order early neutral evaluation. If we can order that, they asked rhetorically, why can't we order um, the parties to go away and mediate? And there's been a working party um, uh, recently published a paper saying, well, it is legitimate to order people um, 
to mediate. Silver Jackson said um, it is the threat of a trial around the corner that makes people take mediation seriously. It's a good thing. Um, so they're now working on sort of the, 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 the technicalities of it and what matters are uh, appropriate. Um, uh, what sanctions do you impose, which is an intriguing point, if people still point blank to refuse to engage in ADR? Um, and also, which I think is very interesting, should there be a court approved list of mediators. So um, I'm expecting that maybe next April um, we might see reform, but um, I, I am absolutely confident, 100%, that um, court ordered uh, mediation is coming down the line. Yeah. I do think that's going to come through rules or through um, the court simply making orders. Um, um, that the great point. Um, well, I suspect they, they might sort of work it into the rules and in the same way that early neutral evaluation. Um, was um, added to um, the court powers back in whatever in 2015. So um, I think it will go um, into the rules. But the fine tuning is always, you know, it's always going to be down to um, judicial discretion. But there is a sense that it, it is a good thing. And uh, I mean, one of the things I, I say, I said about um, uh, Part 36, which is another mechanism for for getting or trying to get shot of cases. Um, the, the perverse thing is that judges don't want to judge. They want cases to go away. There's this great backlog of work. Um, and the more they can get shot off, frankly, um, the better. So I, I, I think it will come. I, I, I don't have a scintilla of doubt. And of course, um, with the backing of Sir Geoffrey Voss, who I, I've never met, but um, strikes me as a, as, as a driven man and somebody with a very clear you know, agenda of what he wants to achieve. I think he's going to go down in history as, as a phenomenal um, MR. I really do. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'd certainly endorse that view. It's um, really, really impressive, and particularly in case management matters when he was still a, a puny judge. Um, a question I, I did have when I was reading the report of the Working Party uh -huh. on, on ADR was it struck me as they were a little bit quick. They were obviously very keen on it, and so the starting yeah. work is going to be recommended. I thought they were a bit uh, short on concerns about the, the costs which can be involved if you were to say something like mediation. Yes. I mean, they gave examples of situations where the rules might require you or, uh, to, uh, to make an offer um, to, to the other side. And that, I accept, is, is not going to be hugely expensive. But as soon as you start getting involved in further processes, then yes. like it or not, people are going to gear up for it. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be, you know, as great as a trial, but it's certainly the experience um, of mediation is that it can be extremely expensive. Yeah, well, I think it, Jeremy, the answer to that in one word is proportionality, that it's got to be um, proportionate um, in, in Birmingham um, and for some years now um, in the small claims track, the, the courts are ringing up litigants and often litigants in person and saying, look, can we have, you know, would you like us to sort of do some sort of try and manoeuvre this over the telephone and just see if we can't, you know, get parties to, to come to some sort of agreement. So um, it is, I mean, I, I appreciate that vast sums of money can be um, spent on the process, but it has always got to be um, a proportionate measure. And um, there's a, 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 this nice guy called Mark Field, who's a, an arbitrator in the, in the um, northwest of England and I mean he's told me that he's done arbitrations right across the spectrum and you know, um, sometimes you know get, getting paid like 50 pounds or something but but he will do it and, and, and mediation is is, is seen as a, as a good thing but oh and, and it is not the universal panacea I appreciate that but there is a sense that if people were to engage more then more matters would would would, would settle um, do you think, uh, Dominic, do you think that, that, that there's a prospect that that compulsory ADR might actually come into cost litigation as well? I think it would go that far down. Well, you know, that I think in a way it, there's an even more powerful argument in the <laughs> sense that, you know, well, seriously, in the sense that um, if there is a court order, you know, that you've got your costs, you know, accepted part this, whatever, you've got a cost order, then mm. there is a definite liability. There is something to sort out, contrast that with litigation, where you so often you get a defendant say, yeah, well, we've done nothing wrong. And so the whole thing is, is you know, it's up in the air, but on costs, yeah. And Colin, Master Campbell, Colin Campbell, 
who is again a, a, a deputy master, but um, I think a, a, a massive talent. Um, and he's been pushing hard on cost mediation. I know Peter Hurst um, has been doing cost mediation. And uh, I saw Nick Bacon only yesterday. And he said, you know, there's one case he did come across recently um, where Peter Hurst was really made, a even though it didn't resolve the matter, he gave them a steer, which I think put parties on the path to settlement. So, yeah, um, and it was, it was a case where perhaps Master O'Hare, I think but maybe 2015, um, um, made a, 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 an, a ordered a defendant to pay indemnity costs because they refused to mediate in a cost dispute. So, um, it, I mean, the, there are these sporadic examples out there, but I think mm. that the, you know, the movement is getting more and more powerful. Absolutely. It, it's so definitely it's, my experience that it's um, that some parties seek to weaponize it. Yeah. Uh, uh, in, in order to get a better settlement. Um, sure. That, you know, you're going to have to do this as well, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, it's another, another mountain to climb. Yeah. Exactly. And, and sometimes I have to it say be... I prefer it. I prefer being frank about it. I, I think the best thing about mediation where I mean we're not mediators, we're hired guns from one side or the other, but um, the advantage of actually not being face to face with your opponents for uh, a long time is very attractive. Um sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it is. It dead well, right. it is. You know, the, the, the temperatures tend to uh, you know tend tend to reduce, which is what you need in that situation. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, and and who knows what you know? We've had a pretty good record, I think, the ones I've been involved in, of finally getting there. And it, and it's always darkest before dawn, just as you think it's going to mm. not happen. It does, you know. It tends to be the pattern. So that's why these things are so unpredictable in many respects. Sure. Which is that sure. you know the things that look the most unsettlable, funnily yeah. enough, you know. They, can, they, they, uh, and I completely bear out what you say about sometimes um, it, it, there's a good record, not just even if you don't settle at the mediation, there's quite a good record of settling within sort of 10 days of a mediation because yes, yeah. people Food sort of calm court. down and look at it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, narrow down areas. Um, Jeff Mitchell, who I know has instructed um, uh, Jeremy as a mediator um, uh, before Jeff, Jeff was head of claims at the MOD and his top tip, he said, Dominic, with mediation, the golden rule is you set a finishing time and you absolutely stick to that and that and which I thought was good wisdom because I've never been to a mediation but he said that really does concentrate the mind and the danger is that these things can dribble on which I think is is unattractive but to say Jeremy's mediated I haven't so I, I you know I defer to others but it's interesting that, that um ADR is generally seen as mediation but of course it isn't just that there are other forms there of, are. Uh, I was, of, of ADR it, which are equally important for the in, in appropriate cases Sure. Yeah. Well, I always say that, you know, ADR, sorry, mediation is a chapter in the book of ADR, but certainly the senior judiciary only ever talk about mediation. And I've certainly heard, um, uh, you know, noises saying, there's well, always, I mean, talking about counsel, there's no, no criticism of counsel, but, you know, they're there to protect the corner, whereas the mediator, you know, they come, they've got no baggage, they are looking for common ground, they are looking to um, you know, they're like matchmakers, aren't they? They're trying to find, um, you know, love and common ground between the parties. And so I think that, uh, I mean, so one, one or two cynics have said, oh, it's because when they retire, they want to become mediators. But, um, but you know, I rise above that. I, 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 I know you're, you're right, you know, council to council, round tables are other mechanisms, but it, it is seen as, as something really important. And, uh, yeah. you know, I grew up in the days of, you know, bitter I, I was trained at article at Thompson's and um, it was open warfare. There was one insurer, iron trades, and, you know, they used to mm. sort of set, send, you know, arsenic to each other in the post and stuff. But, um, but and it was really, it was, it was hostile. It was, yeah, yeah. Ritz issued without a, a letter of claim, the great late Leslie Joseph QC, I think, uh, told me about that. So um, anyway, <laughs> I think we've come up, we've got a lot more civilised in, in recent years, I think, I hope. Yes. Well, the, the, whole we'll argument about, cruel. the whole <laughs> argument about ADR being made mandatory reminds me, living as I do in Italy, of the suggestion that vaccination might be made mandatory, which is a very, very hot potato here. Yeah. I wonder if it might, if, if the mandatory uh, ADR might generate similar sort of heat in the legal profession. In, yeah. uh, in I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I say that the, the decision about early neutral evaluation and the commercial court, apparently the commercial court um, uses meeting after 
um, the case of Lomax in nine, 2019, the commercial court said, we are really keen on this. You know, the idea of saying to parties at an early stage, um, giving them a, a, a quiet steer about how a matter appears to the judge, and maybe saying, look, you know, and in Lomax, both sides were legally represented, but the judge, she plainly felt that one side, maybe both sides, were barking up the wrong tree, and she wanted to give them that steer, but she decided she couldn't order it. And the Court of Appeal brilliantly, I thought, in about one hour on a, a morning, was it 6th of August 2019, said, it's a court power, it's for the court to determine. Uh, how it uses its powers. It's not for the parties to tell um, uh, the court how to conduct litigation. And I thought that was a brilliant example of you know, active case management using a, 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 a specific power of the court. Um, I, I should mention, I should intervene at the stage to say something I always forget to say earlier, which is um, Dominic's kindly sparing us detailed uh, case references, but don't worry, um, there will be a note of this uh, session sent out to all those who've participated and that will include case references where Dominic does refer to a case. Thank you. So well, you just whilst you mention that, can I just say, I regard, and I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not on anybody's payroll here, but I just think these, these are, I'm so honoured to be asked to do it, and I regard them as sort of like the equivalent of public service broadcasting. I've watched every one of them, sometimes repeatedly, and I said, I've learned so much. And I, you know, my, my dream day is waking up with a, a part 36 transcript. So, um, so there you are. <laughs> from the heart, from the heart, absolutely, yeah. The next thing we were going to talk, touch on probably quite briefly is, is budgeting. Um, yeah. Dominic had a great deal of experience in the, in the pilot and the introduction of this whole um, idea into the court system. And how does that play out compared with what's happened since? Okay, well, unrecognisable, Jeremy, is, is the short answer. Um, in two, as a story here, if you've got, it, if you've got a minute. Um, but in 2011, um, I was invited um, to, to go and see um, Sir Rupert. In fact, Lord Justice Ricks was there as well. And the, um, the judge in the um, Mercantile Court in Birmingham, who is an amazing man. Um, he's on Judge Simon Brown, um, QC. And um, we went out to lunch and they said, right, would you be happy to monitor what's going on because there's a pilot scheme um, launched in Birmingham and I'm a Birmingham boy and um, not that I live there now, but, uh, but I, I, I was delighted to do it. And I was given the warmest welcome, Simon Brown, because sometimes people can be very offish and they're thinking, you know, what, who do you think you are? What are you doing? He was phenomenal. He insisted that I sat with him on the bench and saying, what do you think about this? And what order would you, all this sort of thing. But, anyway, but the, the great thing about it Remember, and and yeah, you know, it wowed me, and I, I reported in confidence to um, Sir Rupert to that effect, is that it was a light touch, but my God, it was magnificent. So, for example, um, he would say to the parties, I so said the case management conference here, right? Well, um, right, who's representing you? And a number of times I say, right, we we got a silk. He said, this is not a case for a silk. This is a two hundred thousand pound claim. Any decent, you know, middle ranking um, senior junior can deal with it. This is not worthy of a silk. And these things would all be recorded. Um, how long is the trial going to take? Let's say three days. Say, Look, this is a day, a day and a half tops. How many experts? And they, you know, they, they all want experts. They're right. We're going to have a single joint expert um, about things like you know, one case about the validity of a document. So we needed a. Um, uh, handwriting experts. So let's get a single joint expert um, and that would be a lot cheaper, a lot faster. And it, on, in about 20 minutes, and I, I know it, it sounds trite, but it, it really put things into focus. Um, you know, what a, a great thing, which I, I to this day adhere to, is it, right, what, what are you really arguing? You've got all these art things in your statement of claim, your defence or statement of case, um, but what are you really arguing about? Because that is the, my agenda for trial. And once I've got that agenda, I can finesse, I can produce, um, you know, uh, proper directions. And, it, and people, uh, you could just see tens of thousands of pounds dropping off the bill with, you know, um, these guide, to guidance about disclosure, experts, witness statements. Um, I was a massive fan of that. But that, of course, then morphed by um, um, 1st of April 2013. Um, into something much, much more um, elaborate. Um, and in fact, I could tell it was um, my idea, um, I can mention this now, um, it was my idea that in, in lower value cases, you only had to fill in some of the, um, the front page 
of the, the, the precedent H, whatever, um, trying to keep things simple. But I'm, I'm all for simplicity. And there is criticism, I know. In fact, your last um, uh, podcast mentioned this. Um, some judges thinking it, it, you know, it's, just, it's just overwhelming. And, um, but I, I mean, the concept is, is good. And I say what I saw in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the Birmingham pilot, I thought was just a lovely way of you know getting getting down to the nitty gritty, not this forensic you know spreadsheet electronic bill analysis, um, much more basic, much more fundamental. But it, I was horrifically impressed, honestly. Yeah. And how did you think the results? Because you end up with a figure um, yeah. in the budget. How do you think that um, played out in connection with in, in relation to the actual costs that would necessarily yeah, well, be incurred? Was yeah, it about right? Yeah, well, broadly so, of course, Jeremy, bear in mind that um, back then we didn't have Rule 3, I mean, the Rule 318 only came in 2013, so, and we, in fact, we didn't know, I think, until 2017, that sort of um, the budget was to displace um, detailed assessment, so I think it was more a matter of being, you know, on the record, parties being told, and the court recording, uh, and I think requiring the parties um, to record exactly what the judge had said. So not that I was involved in the um, detailed assessment subsequently, but what I understood is that, um, and Richard Lum, uh, who is a, a marvellous regional cost judge um, in Birmingham, um, you know, that, that they, they, they take this on board and you know, they say, well, you, you were told that you were, this wouldn't uh, justify a silk. If you've used a silk, that's it. That's your luxury. That's down to you into you and client, but into parties, you're not having it. So it did work, yeah. I mean, the, the problem, the one problem um, with the pilot scheme um, is that it was um, voluntary, forgive me, um, but it was voluntary. And um, um, uh, the judge, um, I won't name names, but he thought that one very large Birmingham practice uh, could regularly be seen getting the train um, from Birmingham New Street to go and issue in London and avoid the budgeting scheme. But, um, but there you are. Um, but 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 those who um, I think participated in it, I think they saw benefit. In fact, I went. Um, um, his honour, uh, Michael Cook, um, came along to one, and he thought it was a very good idea. He said, it "Really, it's more like cost capping than budgeting." But um, he he thought it was good as well. So it wasn't just the uh, the, the junior um, saying, "I like this." Yeah. But when it comes to replacing detailed assessment in practice. Yeah, then it's a bit different to cost capping. That's I, I one of the criticisms that was made. That. Yeah, it was a it was a different animal. I absolutely get yeah. that, Jeremy. It was, but you know, for, it it did it did people a lot of good and was not elaborate, but it was effective, and I absolutely stick by that. Yeah. I yeah. wanted next to 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 come on to um, what I can just describe as Dominic's favourite case. Um, <laughs> well, I have many. Yeah, <laughs> uh, this was your favourite case of last year, I think. It was. Um, it's a case called Essex and UBB Waste. And um, it's a decision of Mr. Justice Pepperall, who um, is red hot on part 36. Um, he was the architect of the last reforms to part 36 in um, uh, 2013. Um, I honestly don't know, but I surmise he writes the White Book notes on part 36 um, because he contributes to the White Book and it, it'd be a waste of an enormous talent if he wasn't, and I mean, uh, I look at some of the sentiments there and I think, God, that sounds so sensible. It must be Ed Pepperall uh, doing it. But um, the, the Essex case um, was um, in, on lots of fronts. And I say to people, go and read um, this case. Um, we have a magic circle firm getting into difficulties making a part 36 offer. And um, the recommendation um, of the judge in that case was, well, they should use the court form because it keeps one on the straight and narrow. Um, and he rejected some, I, I, it, was, it was poetry to me. Um, this business that um, happens whereby people add a, a rider to their offers saying, if you think there's something wrong with our offer, you must tell us in seven days. And he absolutely quashed that and said, it is the fundamental obligation of the offeror, the client, the solicitors, to get their offer right. It's not the duty of the recipient to tell them uh, what for. Um, I, I, and he said, there is, there is no estoppel here. You know, you, and indeed that again fits in with part 36. Um, you know, part, we were told over and over again, particularly since given in what, 
2010, part 36 is a code. Um, it is a, a pretty rigid structure of rules and offers are therefore um, either in or out, they are good or bad. And the, the notion that somebody could make an invalid offer, a non-compliant offer, and then because the other side didn't say something, somehow magically this has been transformed into a good offer, I always thought was complete and utter tosh. Um, there have been a couple of cases over the years where judges had gone down um, that route. Um, Mr Justice Pepperell said, well, that can't be right, that's incompatible with the scheme and um, with the requirements. So it was such a, a good case. Um, also, I mean, I could talk about it for about three days, I think, but um, um, interestingly, um, the offer wasn't, um, by the claimant, wasn't expressed in money terms, but it was uh, a series of undertakings they'd be prepared to accept. And so, um, which again demonstrates the, the, the breadth, the scope of part 36. And um, they, they got, as the judge determined, a better outcome at trial. And because, um, and it also, the case also then took us over into conduct matters and um, indemnity costs were awarded against the defendant on conduct, which coming back to part 36, um, because um, of the defendant's conduct, the judge thought it was a bad case and therefore um, the claimant got interest at the maximum under part 36, 10% above base rate. So it was just one of those judgments that is just bursting with pragmatism and wisdom, common sense. And I really, really recommend people have a read of it. It had uh, practically everything that you can get in these post-trial um, decisions, which are now so much more complex than they yes. used to be, yes. with issues like uh, interest being argued about. But when I started at the bar, uh, as a solicitor, in fact, uh, a long time ago, and, and and probably when you started rather less long ago, um, oh, you'd have a trial. Uh, the trial would go on for a week about some relatively small sum of money. At the end of it, somebody would say, I'd like some costs. The judge would say, yes, of course. That was the end of it. I mean, that yeah. was the judge's contribution to anything to do with, um, with relief costs. other than an award of damages. Absolutely. Uh, and this case... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the one thing this case doesn't have, and it's no fault of the judges, no. um, is very often in these cases, there's also an argument about who's won. When yeah. um, somebody's been you know, 60% successful, the other side's yeah. been 40%. So, and and, and the, the, that's usually the first argument. Um, yeah. But all these issues about then interest and conduct uh, yeah. and uh, indemnity costs, both under Part 36 and, in, as in this case, pre-Part uh, 36, Sure. Um, we're, we're, we're dealt with um, very clearly. It, it, it's, a, it's a model judgment. Um, and it's also, I think, a, a very good, um, it's like mm. a checklist for it a barrister or, or any yeah. advocate to go yes. to when they're preparing for, you know, they've got the judgment, that they know what the judge thinks, but these are the things we've got to argue about. Yeah, um, and because it's, it's a first instance judgment, you may not want to cite it as authority for everything, but it's mm. a really good aid memoir. I think, it's, I think, it, and it covers so much terrain. And for, Jeremy, if I just may add one more point, which again is so common in litigation. This is the case. Claimant, local authority sues. Defendant comes back with a humongous counterclaim. At trial, the claimant was awarded, I think, nine million in damages. The counterclaim at trial has it risen to a hundred million pounds. And Mr. Justice Pepperell was having none of this. It was the classic sort of, you know, they, they put the frighteners on the claim and try and scare them away, a public body. And that was one of the reasons for awarding indemnity costs, because the counterclaim was, in his view, in his determination, um, groundless. So, I mean, so many lessons for litigation, litigation, litigators in that judgment. I think it really, it oozes. Mm -hmm. And I can tell, I had a, a chat about um, uh, with, it, with um, uh, Master Campbell, Colin Campbell, and he thought, I think his word was sublime that judgment and I, I couldn't agree more yeah yeah well, i'm really grateful for you highlighting it for us because um the, 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 these sort of judgments that tidy a lot of things up yeah and are written so elegantly you know it doesn't waste a word he and, didn't know and, it. and remove lots of these uh, uh remove lots of silly arguments um yeah. I, I thought was 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 really great i mean even the, the point about the, the the counterclaim you know even makes the point about um um, you know, you, you could have a fanciful defence, but you're not the you're not the person who's making the claim. You know, so you wouldn't necessarily be punished for that. You didn't start Correct. this. 
So, you didn't, but, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't but stop if you take size. a yes. whacking great opportunistic yeah. counterclaim, that's yeah. a different story. It is, um, yeah, yeah, because they're a counterclaiming party is effectively a claimant. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. so he's really saying, I'm not sure I'd, I'm not sure I'd make a indemnity if I've, I've paraphrased it. I mean, I'm not sure I'd make an indemnity cost order, you know, if somebody just puts in a bit of a rubbish defence. No, but this no, is different. No. But this, yeah, is, this diff is different. This is going a step further. And indeed, um, I mean, he observed, I think, that the you know, a public body, Essex County Council, there could be concerns about, you know, funding and, and you know, public body, limited resources. It had an adverse impact. It could have a really adverse impact upon them. And he yeah. thought this was this was really beyond the pale. Yeah. Interesting. Now, in, 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 um, because you had on a, a previous episode, just prove I've, I have watched them all, um, Andrew Hogan. And um, yeah. he wrote a, a great piece in Litigation Funding magazine um, saying that he was um, surprised at the number of cases where he's instructed by claimants and they've never made a Part 36 offer. He was surprised. I was staggered. I mean, it, it's a gift from God. Make offers, make money is one of my uh, little <laughs> mantras for, for claimants. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, if I'm, yeah, if I'm just chucking one more case um, uh, last year, um, but Ben Williams um, in the uh, Court of Appeal um, did um, a case called um, uh, Telefonica, um, which I thought was also mighty important because in that case, um, what the judge had wrongly done at first instance, and some of the cost judges had flirted with this notion, is that when it came to the rewards, um, they said, right, we, we you know, got the raft of uh, enhancements, I think it was called in Calon Construction, I thought that was a, a neat description. Um, but the judge um, in Telefonica said, you can have indemnity costs and you can have the Jackson uplift, but you're not having enhanced interest. And the Court of Appeal said, but this is um, you know, a, a package of benefits. It's not pick and mix. These rewards are there um, a, 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 as a composite package. And the judge was wrong to have withheld, you know, this sort of, you can have this, but you can't have that. And in Telefonica, big win, uh, big win for Ben Williams, who's also, of course, been um, in this hallowed spot before, um, but it meant the claimant got um, an extra £900,000 in interest, not to be sniffed at. But, I mean, the major, for everybody in the land of Part 36, um, the, the rejection of the idea that, you know, you, you withhold some benefits um, is just really wrong. Yeah, have the lot said that the court in in that case, and I found that really important and really illuminating too. Yeah. Although, just for for um, people who are watching, um, the court doesn't have to give the full ten percent. They can. No, it doesn't. Oh, absolutely. It's not in any way and, and bound did, to do that. Um, Jeremy, you're so right. And the reason I mentioned ten percent in the Essex case um, is that um, ten percent is the maximum and is for the worst worst of cases. Um, in fact, I think the, the last time I saw 10% in any real authority was um, 2017 in Glencore Court of Appeal, um, which was Sir Geoffrey Voss, which is also intriguing if you look at the report, because the Court of Appeal got the parties the wrong way round. You can read the opening paragraphs of the judgment. They did. Oh, absolutely, they did. But, um, but anyway, but, so to, I mean, in reality, you know, 2.5%, 3%, 4%. That is, so I, I would suggest, is, is the norm. But in a bad case, and Glencore, um, the court, forgive me if I'm going on too long, um, but in Glencore, um, the court bill sort of shifted direction and said that up to then, um, Part 36 benefits were compensatory, uh, a point going back to an old case, um, I think off the top of my head called Times and Philemy Number 4. Um, uh, so the idea of the benefits was to um, compensate you for the hassle, the aggravation, the worry, the delay, of going to trial, but in Glencore, where um, uh, Sir Geoffrey Voss, uh, I quote, he said, uh, the defendant defended uphill and down dale, close quotes. They argued every last bloody point and, um, and, and they lost comprehensively and he threw the book at them, all rewards of the maximum, including, thank you for the prompt, interest at 10% above base. Good. Um... The other thing uh, we wanted to touch on was, uh, I don't know how much experience there is of it yet, but how's the new witness statement regime being received? Um, it, well, it's very early days, yes, but people are terrified because of the, the, the need for the, the solicitor to certify that they've complied with the requirements. And they are, I mean, they, never in the rules and or practice direction, never ever have we been told how to interview 
witnesses, how to proof. And I, I spent my early days proofing, you know, eight people a day or whatever. So I got, I got vague, but it's sort of nightmares, I think, about proofing people. Um, but um, never before. So um, it is incredibly onerous. And of course, added to the pressure is that the working party, um, is Mr. Justice Andrew Baker, who led it, um, in the final um, uh, sort of, uh, proposals or recommendations, they said the judiciary should not be afraid to name and shame people who fail to comply. So I think, I think without a scintilla of a doubt, it has um, ramped up the costs. It's made it much more expensive, much more elaborate. Um, I think it is challenging. It is, yeah, but it's there. And you know, people can't, if you're in the business and property courts, then you've got to comply, that's it. Is anyone happy with it that you've heard of? Well, I don't know that they are. Um, okay. It's, um, a, I mean, I, I get the point, but you know, when the rules came in, um, the witness statement rules came in um, back in, uh, what was it, 16th of November, 1992. Um, uh, when the rules came in, I mean, the, the rules were clear from the word go that it was supposed to be the witness's own words, the witness's own evidence. But I, I, Jim, I can't think of a rule that has been breached more often than the witness statement rules and people putting in, you know, argument. And um, there was that, um, that Danish customs case, um, which I think has now been struck out and we have no doubt be appealed. But this is a case worth a billion pounds plus 50 five oh week trial estimate. And the both sides were castigated by uh, Mr. Sir Andrew Baker because in the witness statements, they were you know, sniping at each other and you know, that's sort of, you know, you, you know my, my dad's taller than you and your dad and all this stuff. And you, know, and you don't know what you're talking about. And these claims are spurious and there is no such right of action. And he said, this is quite right. This is not what witness statements are about. And in fact, pr prior to implementation, I, I quite seriously, I said, if, if, if what the way to sort it out is for you know, the master roles or someone to say, right, we're putting it down a marker. If from now on, witness statements are non-compliant, we will strike them out and debar that witness from being called. And I tell you, overnight, I guarantee you, you, you bring order to, to, to practice. But um, they got carried away. And uh, so these rules are massively elaborate. And there was nothing wrong with the original rules. Honestly, there weren't. It's just that people see, and they just seem to get away with it, yeah. The other thing which, which hopefully will um, be diminished as a result, though, is the, uh, the I speak here as counsel, you'd receive um, the fifth draft of so-and-so's witness statement for you to, yeah. to go through and, yes. and settle. Uh, and that did always seem to me a pretty strange process. Well, it was, and, and you're so right. And, and in fact, in the, in the new provisions, there is, although there is not a, a limit on the, on the number of additions of a witness statement, there is an express requirement that you have the minimum possible on the basis that with each iteration, we move further and further away from what the witness actually said. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, another piece of news has been the, the new guideline hourly rates. Um, don't think anyone really wants to know precisely what they are, but any thoughts on, uh, on um, the paper um, in general? Um, well, the one sort of just observate, and I've, I've, I've looked at it, um, it it's, there's no sort of clear guidance on when one gets, you know, the, the, the top rates, you know, maximum size, grade one sort of city rates. What work actually justifies that enhanced rate? And um, I was talking to a senior partner at Reynolds Porter Chamberlain, and, you know, we, we agreed that you know, we just, I mean, the, the, it's one of those, you know, like the elephant, you know, you know it when you see it. But, um, but there, there is a lack of guidance. And again, I refer back to um, your December the um, uh, 2020 um, interview um, with the uh, senior cost judge. And um, again, that was illuminating, particularly him saying, uh, we're not you know, adjusting rates for all the years that have gone by. This, he said, didn't he, um, it was hard enough to agree one set of figures, let mm -hmm. alone anything else. But there will be, uh, there are gonna be arguments about people saying, right, we're gonna backdate, um, we'll use the new figures, and then we can discount them a little and argue that we should get the new figures might be subject to a minor adjustment and um, work done in 18 or 19 or whatever it might be. So, and uh, I, I know Andy's uh, made the point before now, um, in fact, made the point back in December um, that you know, um, what, what, 
everything was predicated that people go to an address in a certain part of a city and rates reflected the overheads of that area. And well, well, how are you doing that now with even you know, people going back to work as they are? I know they are, but um, you know, people going in you know, one or two days a week. How, do, you know, how does that reflect? And this is a whole other thing. And Andy's the expert on this, not me. Um, gosh, uh, I mean, I, 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 I actually have some sympathy for people that's in the absence of any, any revision to guideline rates, use some form of indexation to find some form of approximate figure. Yeah. In fact, I think Friston put, put, a, put a table in, 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 in his, uh, the last edition of his book that came out just, just to help it. Um, I, I, what, I, what I sense of might be the future, because I've thought about this a little bit, is, is that um, uh, perhaps we'll just accelerate um, the the market idea of rates as opposed to the cost basis of rates yeah. as yeah. we go forward. Because it's been moving that way a little bit anyway. I mean, I, I think I think cost judges have been more receptive to arguments about, well, what are you charging then, you know, yeah. uh, as opposed to... Um, <laughs> the yes. funny thing I ever had about rates, you actually saw people sort of glasses falling off their faces. Years ago, when it was the House of Lords, there was a registrar there called Valance White who used to do used to do the taxations. Wow. And, uh, we were in a contested taxation. I think somehow I ended up representing the Legal Aid Board and Clifford Chance were representing the other side. And they had an army of people there. They and, do. Um, and, minimum and, 14, my experience. Exactly. Well, <laughs> we why not? <laughs> anyway. I'm all, I'm all, I, I'm all in favour. The, <laughs> depending, depending on the day of the week. But the... the um, uh, uh, he managed to uh, he managed to set a rate that was below that that we conceded as the pine party, um, so you don't get any of that anymore. Wow! <laughs> wow! Wow! Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. The, oh, the, uh, that's not how we do it around here. Was the was the way it used to be, um, yeah. but 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 certainly there's a um, I think it's been moving towards more of a more of a market style analysis, and yeah. uh, although I don't I wouldn't at all. Um, criticise any of the statistics and 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 work that's gone into this. Um, I can see it. I can see it moving more that way. Yeah, I think you're right. It certainly helps at least have some new thinking on the subject, as opposed to trying to make the best of, of ten year old rates, isn't it? Yeah, uh, but but oh, but but the idea of establishment costs are going to take and 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 changes in establishment costs are going to take an awful long time to wash through. Yeah, you know yeah, you yeah. you're going to get some firms that have just signed up a that just signed up a new 20-year lease just before uh, March 2020, who think it's a brilliant idea for everybody to go back to work and they've got the same overheads they had before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there'll be people that are taking the opportunity to um, uh, take on a more hybrid operation um, yeah. and, and work it that way. Um, we'll see. I mean, I mean hopefully it, will, um, it won't be another gargant gargantuan exercise in two years' time. Maybe it'll just be a tweak in the end. But it's It's actually part of the discussion. I find quite interesting. As a sure, interesting to also the the idea that you have to indicate where um where the particular fee is working. We might get people jumping on the train from Birmingham to London. Yes. Um, in the way that uh, Dominic was mentioning. Right. You get us going about the common partners rule in a minute, Jeremy. That's one of my <laughs> worst days in court. You had to rescue me on appeal. I seem to remember. <laughs> um, one, for the, one for the old school that, uh, that's yeah. well and, and another one for the old school was Dominic had um, has been always as always reading very widely and he's read the memoirs of Lord Dyson um, yes. and he came across a nice little quote in that oh yeah I, mean, I, I, I can't recite it off the top of my head but it, Lord, suffice to say Lord Dyson expressed and by the way of, of the memoirs I've read recently because everybody's writing the, the legal memoirs at the moment. Um, but um, he, said, uh, he said, and there are these things called cost lawyers. And, and, and they argue, all they do things is to argue costs. And they have meetings and conferences and law reports. And he is, you know, the tone of, you know, the, the shocked virgin that this was going on out there. I howled with laughter at that, but uh, there you are. Well, I can, and just to complete the anecdote, um, when he became deputy head of civil justice and responsible um, for things like that, um, 
all three of us used to go to these conferences organized by the CJC, I think, in various country houses around London. And uh, the first one of these that he came to in this new role, he came up to me because I was in the same chambers as he'd been in and said, uh, who are all these people? And I said, well, it, it, they're all these cost specialists. He said, all these people here to argue just about costs. I don't <laughs> believe it. <laughs> Which I didn't convince him because he hasn't changed his mind. No, no, no. But, uh, but it, it does make, I, I looked up um, a quote which I remembered um, from Maurice K, Lord Justice Maurice K in Crane yeah. and Cannon's Leisure in 2007. And this is the quote. Um, On the other hand, the solicitor may elect to instruct specialist costs counsel, brackets, for such people exist. Close oh, brackets. You can see the condescension sort of pouring yeah. off the upper lip. Can't you? Oh, God. Oh, I, must, I don't know that case, but Jeremy, thank you. I will dig that out. That's brilliant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, anyway, look, it's as ever, it's been fascinating chatting to you, Dominique, and thank been, you so much. It's for been fabulous. It's been such fun, and uh, yeah, well, I'm really glad to have done it. Thank you. Uh, as I said earlier, there will be a note um, going out to everybody who's participated in this, and uh, any queries, emails will be responded to. Uh, I think emails to Practico in this particular mm -hmm. case. That's right. Um, and so we look forward to seeing you again at the next one. Thank Thanks. you again so much, Dominique. Thanks, Dominic. Thanks, Jeremy. Great. Bye.